I, uh, I suffered an injury at my day job last Saturday. So, uh, I'm in kind of recuperative mode, even though I still have to work full shifts at said day job uh, for the next few weeks. <laughs> I work four days a week. That's going to change to three in two weeks. Uh, so I must work Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, in a lot of pain. So this isn't a, a an entreaty for, for pity or anything. <clears throat> I'm merely stating I'll be less productive, have been less productive, will be less productive on all of my projects across the board. Uh, by that time, by the, by the time I started feeling a bit more rested about middle of next week, uh, I should be able to, I will need to devote an entire episode, uh, hopefully a short one, <laughs> we'll see, of the show to the future plans for the show. Uh, still waiting for a few things to, to, uh, manifest. And of course this issue with my health has, uh, delayed that somewhat, but luckily I'm collaborating with some people that are helping me keep the ball rolling. And that collaboration itself is part of the, uh, nature of exciting, uh, future plans uh for blue review so to tide you over till then because i know people are just waiting with with bated breath just drooling for new content from from henry covert um being sarcastic but it's possible i can dream uh, i have had a another rise in subscribers and i appreciate it thank you very much uh I'm gonna go ahead and get this long delayed review out of the way. I actually shot a review of this particular film on my phone. I shot it on my phone as I did a couple of videos a couple of months ago when I was uh, having some trouble with storage space on the laptop. Um, I bought a selfie stick. I've, I think I've mastered the, <laughs> the high technology of the selfie stick. Uh, so I will be shooting more videos, uh, Blue Review and otherwise on there, uh, and um, also using the, I use this for TikTok, which I'm now on, and I'll give you more details on all that when I give you that announcement video. So anyway, I shot a review of this film, and I, I just I couldn't quite finish it. Uh, I was in pain, and I could not focus. I'm going to do my best to get through this one today. Uh, it's a film that probably a lot of you have seen or are familiar with, so I don't need to make it super long. I just want to tell you, basically, here it is. Here's what it's about. Uh, here's what I think of it, and how is this edition? So it's Audition, Audition, by Takshi Miike. This is the Arrow Blu-ray edition, edition of Audition. And um, you know what? This is incredible. So I sold my... Cine, uh, American Cinema, Cinematique slash Egyptian Theater, a uh, little orange gate folded DVD, which had, had this cover. Uh, I sold it about a year ago. Um, I think in, for $9. I think it cost me 17 when it first came out at Borders, but I had a 30% discount. Uh, it was one of the first Mike films I'd seen, of course, uh, back then, it was it was somewhat recent. Uh, it came out in 1999. Uh, I think I bought the DVD around 2003, um, so relatively recent. But it was it was very talked about, very uh, um, la lauded at that time. <clears throat> back then, I did not have internet in a, on a regular basis at the house where I lived. That came in 2004. That was a life changer. But in my occasional uh, forays onto the internet, and of course, keeping up with uh, the few magazines, print magazines back then that uh, were around that talked about horror. Uh, I think Rue Moore was in its early years then. Uh, there was a lot of ink on audition. And um, so when and I had some friends who had seen it, 
um, or owned the DVD, and but I had not watched it myself, so I bought it blind. And watched. It. Sorry for all these uh, pop-ups here and interferences. Um, I'm probably used to it by now. Um, I had seen City of Lost Souls. That was my first experience with Nikkei. Don't ask me why I picked that one. Uh, we had that, uh, and then I also shortly after that uh, picked up Happiness of the Katakuris, uh, where I started to see that surrealism uh, a lot more than in what I thought was uh, somewhat conventional uh, post-Tarantino uh, shoot 'em up movie, albeit stylish, City of Lost Souls. Um, so Audition was uh, tighter and, and I don't wanna say slicker, the tighter, tighter and more well-made, higher production values uh, than City of Lost Souls was, which you know in itself was one of his better looking films from that period, but not one of his better written ones in my opinion. Um, but Audition was next level as far as the horror and imagery and extremity uh, and intensity, uh, but it's very slow burn, coiled intensity horror that you know, has a well thought out story behind it. It's based on a novel by uh, Ria Murakami. Uh, I've talked to some people who've uh, read the novel, especially my good buddy, Tim McLean. He says the movie is fairly close to the source material uh, plot wise in any case. Uh, actually these notifications that are interrupting me now are people getting back to me about the aforementioned uh, channel announcement I'll have next week. Or, but anyway, um, so I'll try to tune those out or repeat myself when, as needed. So, uh, Takashi Miike's audition, so it's interesting because I've spent on and off uh, portions of the last year, uh, I know it's always all about me, right, uh, on dating sites. Some paid for, for short periods of time, uh, as many free as I could, as I could, uh, you know, get, and um, as many of that I thought would suit me or would, would uh, fulfill any of my needs, wants, desires, whatever. Um, there have been some uh, nice experiences. Uh, there have been some absolute other uh, demoralizing disasters. One relatively, relatively recently, um, and uh, which I was still recovering from uh, mentally and in other ways when uh, I had my accident at work. So uh, obviously April wasn't my month, uh, which is <laughs> one of the reasons on uh, my Superman 2 video, uh, I did the music clip at the beginning over the credits as the song April by Deep Purple uh, from their one of their early albums. And you know, the, the first opening lyric after a lengthy uh, neoclassical passage, which was a new deal back in 1968 for rock music, uh, is, uh, quote unquote, April is a cruel time. And yeah, I don't know, maybe I was, uh, manifesting that for myself inadvertently, or perhaps I was just commenting on what was already in motion. So I had these, uh, but I've had various bad experiences. I had a few good experiences. Uh, I had one date. I've had exactly one in-person real date out of all this. Uh, someone, you know, in-person date. Uh, and she's very kind, you know, uh, we're friends. Uh, we don't speak uh, very often, uh, but you know, I follow her, we follow each other on TikTok now uh, and occasionally we message. And uh, she's a very kind person. Uh, of course, I alluded to her in one of my many uh, overly confessional, you know, too much information uh, about myself videos a while back. I did not name her name though. And, and you know, I, I, did, I didn't make a big deal of the fact that it didn't head in the direction that I was thinking, hoping, expecting, wanting, whatever. But that was okay. I mean, no hard feelings. So she's a great person. Um, but uh, there have been some other good people and some mediocre people and, and some really bad, bad people. So this is that, this movie, uh, uh, this should have been an omen for me uh, as far as this last experience I had, which, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, which closed the door, I think, on a chapter.
uh, in my life as far as online dating. I, I'm not going to say it's ended, but uh, spending money on it, which I never spent an entire, a, a whole lot, uh, that's over with. And devoting as much time to it, that's over with. Um, and I did lose some money in other ways because of it. And I felt really foolish and violated. I don't know if that's happened to any of you guys. I know it's happened to a lot of women, but to my female friends, men get catfished and scammed also because, and not just because we're crazy for sex, but you know, loneliness, companionship, um, emotions, whatever, and, and not being able to resolve certain levels uh, uh, of, of hurt from prior uh, serious relationships, which as anybody who's followed this channel, these three last three years know that it's it's been a long journey for me doing that uh, with my last uh, very serious relationship in which I almost got married. So I feel for this cat played by, uh, his name's, uh, am I gonna get his name right? Ishibashi, Rio. Ryo Ishibashi. So he plays this character, Ayama, and he works in TV production. Uh, and he has a buddy, and I can't think of this actor's name. They didn't do an interview with him on this Blu-ray. But but he's in um, several Mikae's films also, usually as a Yakuza. So he's like his producer. And uh, basically, this guy loses his wife in the beginning, uh, Ayama, and his son's like a little kid. And then we jump forward, I think it's seven or eight years, uh, and uh, the kid's now a teenager and starting to date. And he's kind of ribbing his dad uh, when they do dad-son things, like whatever dad-son things they do in Japan. Apparently fishing's one of them. I have no idea. I'm not, I, <laughs> I'm kind of, I'm joking, but I really don't know the cultural norms there, but uh, I, I seem to find, be finding out a lot of cultural abnorms from watching these kind of movies. But anyway, they just have this little talk, and it's not like a serious talk. It's really more the kid is uh, giving his dad kind of gently, gently giving him hell for, hey, hey, it's about time for you to date. Like the kid's basically saying, hey, it's okay with me now. I know you're not going to replace my mom, but what about your needs? And the dad's reticent. But, you know, between him, his co-worker and his son, he's like, you know, and I think even they have a, 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 a maid that comes in sometimes, and, and she's also on board for this. So he goes along with it. Like, sh shouldn't you get remarried? Isn't it time? So man is early 40s and a widower. So uh, him and his co-worker concoct this uh, scheme to uh, audition uh, young ladies ostensibly for a... TV commercial, and so they'll get their work resume, personal information, and say a little bit about yourself, sum yourself up, and then of course they will appear in an audition room where they'll, you know, just talk about themselves and or display some kind of talent, dancing or baton twirling or whatever. You know, it's kind of like a beauty pageant kind of thing. Um, and of course, uh, not only does it fulfill all the usual requirements of those kind of auditions. But it also, of course, uh, fulfills the uh, needs of Oyama in finding out what these women are like and who he thinks uh, would be best matched to him based on the overall gestalt and, of course, how attractive he finds them physically, but also their personality, what they're like, you know, what their specialized talents or worldview or whatever is. And most of it, it you know, they, they see a lot of people. Most of it's very superficial, as you can imagine. Humorous, humorous vignettes. Uh, but early on, he, he, he happens to uh, come upon one particular young lady on the stack name, uh, Asmi Yamazaki, um, played by Ihishina, um, who had no clue, I'm sure, doing this movie that, that her and her character here would become an, uh, an icon a female icon of modern horror, but she definitely is, absolutely. And um, I'll, I'll get to why and how in a minute. So he's got his heart set on her over the others. 
Uh, but she's kind of mysterious. Some of the information they asked for is kind of vague. Some of the things she says are kind of vague, but she's extremely demure. You know, she has her head down and, you know, the Japanese kind of nod and, and she's very, you know, prim and well-mannered and wears dresses and she's, you know, dainty and, and uh, beauty with, you know, of course, extremely long, of course, black hair. And she has kind of a, uh, her eyes are interesting, uh, you know, uh, seemingly kind, but kind of implacable. But, you know, that's what happens when you're dead inside, but, but you're good at uh, pretending that you're not. Um, sociopathic kind of thing. So they meet, they go out to eat. And of course, he he finds her passage in her writing and her uh, thing she filled out for the audition. Uh, he's just blown away by it. He reads it over and over. He talks to her about it. And it's unusual, somebody of your age and your, you know, nowadays to have this kind of depth and flaw. And of course, you know, what she says is kind of philosophical, uh, especially compared to, you know, how the others that they show seem to come off. But as with a lot of uh, us guys and maybe women too, when we're really looking for that whole package of, of, of traits, uh, of um, qualities, sometimes we ascribe too much weight to something that is actually not very weighty. And that's what he does here predictably, you know, because she's sweet and beautiful and, uh, and you know, perfectly available and you know all this other stuff um her thoughts to him just sound like just profound you know uh, you know he basically thinks that you know he's he's a guy i guess of average intellect maybe slightly above average his producer's slightly above average for sure uh, oyama for all his life experiences is kind of naive especially the whole dating thing which you can have a lot of life experience and be married, divorced with or whatever, and still be naive about the dating thing. And so I feel you, man. And the, uh, you know, especially when you're, you're wanting things to look a certain way, you're, you're wanting, you're envisioning something, your brain's racing ahead. Everybody's done this time, a time or two or not a time or two, uh, male, female, gay, straight, what have you. Uh, you know, you, you, you feel that rush of feeling and then your mind is like projecting this future scenario. What's it going to be like when I date them, have sex with them, move in with them, marry them, have kids with them, share a home with them, buy a home with them. You know, you're already writing the whole story ahead of time. And some people do it faster than others. And some people recoil from doing it at all to the point where they, you know, pretty much don't let the budding relationship happen at all or, or it end, ends very abruptly. And that latter syndrome seems to be <laughs> seems to be a common one nowadays. Um, I've I made the mistake many times of doing the former one, where I, you know, will fill in all those details. I did it more when I was infatuated with women, and I didn't really know them as people. I didn't really know what qualities as people I wanted. I just wanted someone, you know, that I found physically attractive, that that uh, treated me well accepted me, loved me, was faithful, loyal. None of which are things you, 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 you shouldn't, you know, prioritize, but that's one level, the cosmetic level and, and the bare minimum level, you know, and uh, there's other things like how compatible are you on a day-to-day -day basis? Can you live with this person uh, in, in harmony and not in discord? Um, but anyway, uh, Oyama is, is, yeah, so <laughs> he's just smitten and his brain goes uh, in out of his head. So they go on a couple of dates and of course she's extremely submissive. I don't mean they're having sex yet. And she's submissive that way. I just mean her gen general demeanor is very submissive and maybe to a middle-aged old-fashioned Japanese man that's a perfect demeanor. I could, I could see that easily, or or even to a old-fashioned middle-aged, you know, Caucasian American man, uh, in the year 2000, 1999. 
Um, so yeah, I get it. It's sad though, and it's unfortunate. There, there are no red flags going off in his mind, but fortunately for him, his his buddy, the producer, there are they are going off in his mind. He told him, you know, you're too close to this. You 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 need to be more shrewd, like I am. And Ayama had told him, I, I'm a grown man. I know my mind. I, I can handle anything that happens. And his friend, of course, as friends using tough love often do, reminds him, hey, you told me you could handle this and you were good. And you're not, you know, you're fucking up. You know, what, why are the obsession? And, and it really becomes an issue because they meet uh, at one point at, at his house. It's very... It's a little oblique, this period of the film, and, and I know that's why. It's because the blurring of reality and uh, non-reality, what, what is really happening to this man empirically versus what his mind is imagining, hallucinating, dreaming, uh, it, it's kind of smudged together into this unclear patch. And um, so the way I'm reading it after several viewings of the movie – and I still am a little, the way I'm reading it is uh, they go to his house after a date and she very shockingly seduces him in a very, of course, low key and submissive way. She basically turns the light off. You know, he's about to take her home. He thinks, that, you know, everything's happy. Of course, he's, uh, and she's just like, no, it's okay. You know, turns the light off, begins slowly undressing, you know, <laughs> Asks him to come lay in bed with her after she's totally naked in bed. You know, you don't see her. She's demure, but she's just kind of laying there like, yes, I'm going to spend the night. Yes, we're going to have sex. And he's kind of like, oh. And then, you know, his inhibitions, uh, they're gone pretty fast. I mean, he's not like jumping on her or anything. But he is a man. He is a lonely man. And he is in love with this girl. So we don't see the love scene, but... She's gone the next morning. Uh, that's almost predictable, really. <laughs> uh, you know, who, who has that not happened to by, their, by the time you're in your 40s, male and female, at least once? And, you know, it's a downer. But he reacts obsessively to it. He reacts in proportion to how much weight he was placing on this relationship being the one and working. And that's kind of sometimes what happens. I confess it's happened with me. Your emotions, like if it's not something that's hitting you to your core or fulfilling all those needs you've really wanted your whole life, then when it abruptly ends or just suddenly fizzles out, you know, you can be cool with it, you know. And I've had to learn how to do that over the years, learn not to be emotionally attached. Uh, but sometimes, as in the case, admittedly, uh, with my ex-fiance, uh, you know, um, in, in 2019, um, I, I couldn't, I reacted very, uh, in proportion to the passion and the amount that I was pinning my hopes on, okay, I'm marrying this person, uh, we're gonna, we're starting this business together, you know, we're, we might have a kid together. Or we're going to live together forever. We're creating together on many levels. And I've bored you guys with several uh, <clears throat> maudlin videos about this in, in 2020 and 2021 until I started to turn a corner from it and heal more. And, yeah, you kind of, like, lose it. And uh, he kind of loses it, uh, you know, because he pinned everything on it. And he had what he thought was a great signifier, which is that you know, she was single. She wasn't with anyone else and she slept with him. And that was a big step for both of them based on the kind of people that kind of person he is, the kind of person he thought her to be. And like, okay, this is it. This is sealing, you know, things. So yeah, I, I don't blame a young He's kind of flipping out. So he tries to find her, and he can't find her. He doesn't know where she lives. He doesn't know her address. I mean, you know, there, there's he has her phone number, but you know, uh, the first tip off to the audience really 
is at one point where he calls her after he's deciding not to call her because he is getting over his head. This is before the sleepover. And she's just in her house, you know, with her head down in the long flowing, you know, Sadako like black hair of menace. And um, there's a giant bag, like a giant burlap bag sitting in the room next to her. And she's just passively waiting, waiting, waiting. And the phone rings. And then, and that's in, featured prominently in the trailer because it's, it's kind of chilling in and of itself as a setup. And like, oh, you know, because there are people who have done that all through history of telephones, just waiting by the phone for that person to make that move. I've done it. It's been a long, long, long time, but I've done it. And, you know, <laughs> but what uh, trips everyone out all the time about that particular scene is that, that then the bag moves, like shuffles over. It's tied shut, like whoop. And so it's like, okay, there's someone or something in the bag. So that's the audience is like, I don't know, man, this could go bad. And to be honest, the, 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 the prelude to sex scene, the seduction to me is kind of creepy also, because at that point you're like, okay, something's going to go wrong. When is it going to go wrong? What's going to go wrong? How badly is it going to go wrong? So it mainly goes wrong, badly wrong because he feeds into it. He goes to try to look for her. He tries to, every little clue, every little thing that in her little bio, and she'd wanted to be a dancer one day. She said as a child, that was a passion, and an injury has stopped her from making it her life thing. And um, so he makes quite a few visits, and uh, one of them is to her teacher. And by this time, we have seen some flashes of her youth of a young girl dancing. And that's kind of a symbol that comes up a couple of times. To me, that's that shot's like the end of her innocence. Like she was a sane little girl until that moment. And basically the teacher, you know, uh, obviously, you know, sexually uh, took liberties with her, but also tortured her. Um, you know, he would take these uh, burning, these little sticks that he would, uh, you know, put in the fire and get them, you know, burning hot. And he would brand her on her inner thighs. Of course, she made love to a young man in the dark, so he didn't see that, I guess. Um, I, I think, hmm, she might have seen one scar, and she probably said it had something to do with the accident. I can't quite remember. Uh, so, yeah, this middle period, like Act 2, becomes very manipulative of the of the viewer and and, and succeeds uh, brilliantly at it um, because you're like Oyama, you're like, what is going on? What the fuck is real? What's unreal? Who is she really? And of course, he still has her in his mind cast as this, you know, on its pedestal, but everything still gets creepier and creepier and the encounter with the teacher is very creepy, especially when the guy steps out of his wheelchair and he's got wooden feet. And he's a kind of a raving lunatic. Uh, and that actor is um, Renji Ishibashi. I don't think he's related to our star Rio. But he he's also been in several of uh, Mike's films, memorably as the Yakuza leader uh, in, uh, in Gozu, which I reviewed on this channel a while back. <laughs> Very brief review. Um, but, but, you know, I wanted to come out on Blu-ray. That was the gist of it. And... Uh, you know, he's like a Yakuza boss who's like, you know, a horn dog. He's, he's, and, and he's, you know, in order to continue his uh, dalliances at his advanced age, constantly he's, you know, taking the, the one side of a soup ladle and massaging his prostate with it. So <laughs> he is a very comical and lunatic character in a very comical and lunatic film. Um, this one, he's very dark and uh, a little comical, but very darkly and very, you know, it's frightening because, you know, he's obviously the key to her going full psycho, you know, <laughs> and uh, her, her imprint of her view of men. And 
but you know it looks like he may have paid the price for it with the wooden feet and so we get more into that uh, uh, later and basically after these searches and falling out with his best buddy the producer ayama gets home his son's out i think on a date with his girlfriend uh for the weekend maybe i can't remember and uh he's he's drinking and he's sullen and then he collapses and he is completely paralyzed uh and then she shows up and she's got like these leather gloves all the way up to here and this leather apron and that's where you get the uh iconic i guess asami yamazaki look you can't really see a lot of it in this picture let's see her leather gloves and, and the hypodermic and um she informs him that, you know, yes, she's drugged him. Obviously, she broke into his house because unlike him, she does know where he lives. And uh, drugged is his, his favorite drink. And uh, now he can't move at all. I mean, he, he can twitch a little, like his neck a little and his hands a tiny bit. But that's about it, really. Uh, so he's completely um, paralyzed, but as she, you know, explains he can still feel everything so his nerves aren't you know frozen so in other words she can he can feel all the pain and so she proceeds to enact one of the most infamous torture scenes in horror film history and uh, it's slow and meticulous and involves a lot of needles in very sensitive places including right under the eye you know, just enough not to cause damage but not 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 to where it's like acupuncture and causes no pain it definitely causes pain uh and then she gets out her twine which is this long uh, um barely long uh steel razor sharp thin cord and she talks about how good it is for cutting and uh so yeah everything's gone south okay then he wakes up okay so First time I watched it, I admit it doesn't have as much impact after you've watched it the first time. Uh, you almost kind of see it. I'm going to see it, say, see it coming, but it it flows in and out because of the general confusion of, of Act Two. Um, but the first time you see it, you're like, whoa! It's like an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, you know, or Brazil, where the character uh, escapes from his fate and lives a happy life. Or Last Temptation of Christ also has that device. But then wakes up and whoa, he's still on the cross, or he's he's about to die and he dies. So, um, it, it's sort of like that. Uh, but but anyway, in this case, it's reversed. Like he wakes up from the torture, and everything's okay, and she's in bed with him. I guess it's supposed to be the next morning. And he recoils like, oh my god. Uh, and, and then it seems like you know everything's okay, and um. Yeah, it's not okay. So, you know, basically, he has kind of a trip, like a hallucinogenic trip because of this drug she's given him. And it, it goes beyond what he reasonably would be able to see in his mind's eye. Like, it's all, it's all these memories jammed together and these little red flags and bits and pieces are meeting. So little pieces of, of scenes are repeated again, like a, on a loop, fragmented. Kind of slightly uh, like New Rose Ho in New Rose Hotel by Ferrara, though Ferrara, you know, re repeats like entire scenes. Um, but interspersed with this is a lot of like symbolism and dread and uh, and like nightmare kind of symbolism, and, but also things specific about her past and especially with the old guy uh, with the wooden feet and the wheelchair and uh, his torture for things that he couldn't possibly know but are communicated to us, the audience, through his delirium, like, I don't know. I don't know if they're to be taken literally like he's experiencing those things as visions or just imagining what happened based on what little he does know or seen. But for us, they're really presented as, I mean, sometimes you can tell when something is surreal and not real, and that didn't really happen, but... Uh, a lot of these flashbacks that only she would know about are, are presented as real as the memories he has of her and them together. So 
uh, you're filled in with more and more details of, of, of what she does to men, you know, including our, our guy in the burlap bag. And, uh, you know, we have, we have met him and, uh, somewhere in this, in this act too. And, you know, um, he's missing certain organs, including his tongue. And he lives like an animal inside the bag. And she puts him back in and brings him out to have some milk and gruel every day. Um, and then, you know, Yama's back and he's still paralyzed with the needles in his eyes. So yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I kind of figured that's where he will, where, where things were headed halfway through that, you know, trip the first time I watched it. But, uh, you know, it, it was interesting making that journey. So uh, she begins using the, 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 the twine, the, the steel cable, and be, begins using it to... Uh, we've seen that she's... Uh, by this time, we have seen uh, through some of these flashback images, uh, we've seen that she has murdered the teacher uh, by twirling it around his neck and just going back and forth and sort of cut his head all the way off. Um, and that's obviously what, well, we infer what she'd done to his legs as well. Um, so now she begins doing, doing it to Oyama's legs and she succeeds in severing one of them. <sighs> yeah, these are just some grueling stuff because this stuff, uh, there's a grounded way this is all shot as, as surreal as everything I'm describing is it doesn't have that escape valve of surrealism that some of Mike's violent and gory activities in his films, such as in Gozu and Ichi the Killer, he doesn't have that escape hatch of, of, of lunacy and surrealism. It's like, this is really fucking happening to this guy. This woman is a psycho. Everything he believed to be true is, you know, <clears throat> yeah. So the son comes home and, you know, she tries to take out the son, but the son ends up taking her out, uh, and, uh, you know, accidentally almost, uh, and, uh, you know, as she's dying, uh, with her a big bone sticking through her neck, but not through the skin after falling downstairs, she locks eyes with him still laying on the floor, seeing through the den while the kid is trying to get the police and their eyes meet. And then she starts robotically, uh, rehearsing some of the some of the, the the sweet little idealistic things about herself she had told him earlier and and you know you watch it and you, I'm kind of wondering like is she really saying all that or is she already dead or is she just kind of twitching and he's just hearing that in his mind or is she really saying you know they're definitely their eyes are have met so again it's that it's realistic but it's disorienting you can read it various ways so I mean, I tend to take it, okay, that's literally what happened, but I could see a case being made that that's not exactly what happened. Because, you know, she's, she's, she's obviously now beyond the pale, about to die, but she's still, she's got the robotic, you know, loop in her head of blah, 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 every telling them what they need to hear, these men that she has done this to. And, yeah. So, audition's pretty powerful. I think I've pretty much described how powerful while I was describing the plot. And so I don't really need to go into any further deep analysis. I recommend you see it. Sorry about the spoilers, but that's the way this channel you know, rolls, as people say. Uh, so let me just tell you real quick about this Blu-ray. So this is a brand new 2K restoration of Original Vault Elements. Uh, there's a commentator of Mike and the screenwriter, Daska Tengen, and that is in Japanese. So you can access that track here in Japanese. And then you hit the subtitles and it goes from the English subtitles for the film dialogue, the subtitles of their commentary. Um, and then uh, Tom Mess, uh, Mike biographer, I think he wrote that Mike uh, bio agitator, uh, examines the film and its source novel. That's very helpful. Uh, Mike introduces the film. You know, he, he seems a little bit surprised that it's still so popular, but very grateful. In a very Japanese uh, mannerisms. He's very, he's very grateful. And then there's a brand new interview with him that's fascinating. 
Uh, and then interviews with uh, Ryo Ishibashi, uh, Renji Ishibashi, uh, Ihi Shina, who's gone on to play in these other kind of low budget horror uh, films. Um, and uh, obviously uh, affecting a slightly different look and not as not usually playing a totally evil character, more of a, a campy or, or anti-heroic kind of character. Um, and then our man Tony Raines, this British guy, he he's he know he's known everybody in Asian cinema since the sixties. I mean, he's on the Come Drink with Me Blu-rays on this. You know, he knew everybody, and he knew them way back when before they got big. And you know, he knew them. You know, he knows them up to today. So he's like the Chris Hedges of of Japanese cinema criticism. Like when Chris Hedges will be talking on one of his shows about you know. You know, somebody will say, yes, the Iraq war was bad, and I agree with you. And here's his head just like, I know, I was there in such and such year, uh, and I stood beside them. Or I was there at the Berlin Wall watching it come down. I was there when Bernie uh, announced his candidacy and said, I don't want to be like Rob Nader. You know, so this Tony Raines is like the British filmic equivalent of that for Japanese cinema. Any key event or person of the last 45 years he was there. He was there before it happened, you know, for seeing it happening, for staging it, and watching it unfold, and, and then, you know, becoming lifelong buddies with the people involved. So Arrow has made very good use of him and his, uh, his essays and interviews. Um, trailers, etc. So I think this is a must-have, a must-purchase. I don't work for Arrow, seriously. I did pay money for this at myself. Uh, it was during that spring sale half off that I've done a few videos on because I couldn't believe my fortune at the uh, good fortune or fortune is the right word at the time to have uh, gotten through some financial crises that I've been in for a long time as people who watch this channel know uh, but also uh, this incredible sale happened so I was like you know for once I don't have to depend on my sponsors and um, Patrons, but if you want to be a sponsor or patron, if you want to get a hold of the things for me to review for the channel and for the permanent Blu-ray library behind me, by all means, please do. I have many who have given. Uh, I'm enlisting them in every episode. I list them in the uh, description below the video, um, and I'm thankful to all of you. Um, and uh, please like, please drop a like. I mean, if you hate it, I guess don't, but uh, the proportion of likes to views on most everything on YouTube is is like 10%. Like a video has 100,000 views, it's going to get like 1,000 likes, maybe. Is that 10%? <laughs> but what I'm saying is this is that infinitesimal percentage. So if I get 100 views, I'm lucky if I get two likes. Uh, so... Please help if you can, and please subscribe, because like I said, the channel is going to be expanding, changing, morphing, and I've really got to kind of begin with this channel and this show and build upon it. Um, but, you know, TikTok is the opposite of YouTube. On there, you know, you, you, you make a video, and it's short, much shorter than what I'm usually capable of doing. Say you make a three to five minute video, and uh, you have like, you know, a few days you have like five to 10 likes. That's impressive compared to YouTube, but your views are gonna be like 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. So it's totally the inverse of, of YouTube. So I'm gonna go, trying to keep everything at 45 minutes and under these days. This is the new me. Frankie says, thanks. I say thanks, I love you guys. Hopefully I'll be better soon so I can make that announcement when I get more details also and get everything firmed up. It's pretty exciting. So now I'm going to go rest for a few days in between working for the man. So 